Yeah, so so uh, the, the, the purpose of this talk is, is twofold. So first to remind you of two talks we had on Monday by, by, by Gabor and, uh, and by Boris Kozinski. They, they both talked at length about how you can uh, use machine learning technology to, to, to develop interatomic potentials that essentially replace the need to use DFT for, 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 for any sort of mechanical, molecular mechanics simulation. And um, so the first part of my talk will be to go into a little more detail on sort of one specific aspect of that methodology um, and, and to explain to Lev that there's no magic in this. There's no black box, nothing at all. You can understand every little detail very, very easily. Um, so I, I will try, I'm not sure I'll manage, but I'll try to not use the word deep throughout my talk. So that, that's the first purpose. And then the second one is, so this idea that's behind these potentials that, that, that uh, Gab and Boris have been talking about is, is actually very general, can be applied in many contexts. And over the past maybe year or two, I started dabbling with that. So I just try out a few other things. Um, with, with James, for example, we, we tried to apply it to develop uh, semi-empirical uh, methods. Um, then with a, a former postdoc, Waji Chen, we tried to apply it in, uh, to, to, to variational Monte Carlo simulations. And so, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the potentially is limitless, really, or it seems that way. And so I want to show a little bit that as well, uh, how broad these ideas really are and, and a few other uh, things one might be able to do with them. Okay. But, but all of those new applications are just at the very beginning. And so don't, don't expect the, the most sophisticated results there yet. I'm a mathematician, right? So I'm allowed to just try things out. Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's for context. Um, so, so then just to very quickly now remind you of the interatomic potential business. So the context is you, you have some simulation task, but the key is it's a, it's a molecular mechanics simulation, right? You don't care about electronic structure per se, but, but the electronic structure potential energy landscape is kind of the only one you really trust. Um, in principle, you know, because you're only interested in mechanics, you might be able to use an interatomic potential if you had one that had sufficient accuracy, transferability, etc. cetera, that had all the properties you want. And um, uh, where should that come from, right? So, so in the past, you would write down some very simple functional form. For example, here, this might be a stillinger weber potential. It might be something else. Uh, this is three-body interaction, right? You write the total energy as a sum of, of, of pair interaction plus a sum of three-body interaction. Then you parameterize these two guys. And, uh, uh, you know, you might have... I think still in Javier has maybe four or five parameters, but you might have 10 or 20. But you have a handful of parameters that you can fit to theory or to experiments, and you have, you have a good potential that does a few select things that you like to do. And uh, then, you know, how do you estimate those parameters? Well, uh, I guess sort of 90s, the estimation of the parameters converted not so much any more experiments, pen and paper, but you just generate DFT data and fit the parameters through that. And really, the only thing that's changed now is the functional form, right? So instead of saying, I, I know I have a pair potential in a three body or an EAM potential and I have tens of parameters, I put, I, I write my total energy as a sum of site energies and I replace the site energy with a universal approximator and now I have thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters. And, um, okay. And uh, that's, that's the context of these machine learning potentials and how, how do you want to do this well? But at the end of the day, it's just another constitutive law um, just like this one, right? So these are still some random functional forms with parameters. This is some functional form with parameters. You evaluate it, you run UMD simulation. There's fundamentally no difference at all. Right? Um, okay. So why do you want to do this? Just make sure I yeah. go back to your virtual form. The R's, the R's with oh. Bold R in my slides is always a structure. The, you know, all the atoms in a structure. Uh, the little bold ri are the positions of the atoms. The rij are the relative distances between atoms. And the theta ijk will not appear anymore, but those are angles. Wait, wait, you're yeah? universal. Here? Oh, did I not write this? I'm so sorry. This is an atomic environment, and I'll get into it. Don't, don't worry about it for now. But it's, it's the local environment around an atom. Yeah, okay. But epsilon is universal for all environments? This has one function. You take the, envi the atomic environment is the input into epsilon. And then you have some parameters because you need to fit some parameters to something, right? You can't do it without that. Okay, but it is a, it is a mapping from atomic environments to a real number. Yeah? Okay. All right. Uh, and the, the reason you want to do this, this is, uh, Gabo had this on his slides as well, is because, of course, you, you, well, it's, 
I said accuracy and transferability before, you get excellent accuracy. So these are all errors on different material properties, but not just excellent accuracy, but excellent accuracy across many, many properties, not just a handful. That, that's, the, that's the key point. And uh, so really the way to think about this, therefore, because you can achieve this to get accuracies down on pretty much anything you want in principle, um, it, it's just a surrogate for, for DFT now. There, there is no, it's, it's not, not really a, an ad hoc model or an empirical model anymore. It, it, is a, it, it, is, it is simply a surrogate for the DFT simulation. Yeah? Okay, so that, that, that's for context. And so now um, th there are many ways, of course, to, to go about this. And uh, maybe I shouldn't even talk about the things I'm not going to do. So I'll just go straight to, um, to, to, to the, the, the kind of models that, that we use. Uh, so Gabo mentioned the atomic cluster expansion, ACE. Um, and uh, okay, so here it is. Uh, so, so again, we start from a parameterization of total energy in terms of site energies. Okay, so the site energy is parameterized and it depends on all the atoms in an atomic environment. I write Xij now because I, I want to be a bit more precise and say this doesn't just depend on the positions but also on the chemical species of the central atoms at I and the neighbors at J. And then I'll just lump it all into a single variable. Um, okay, um, and uh, it depends on the, on the set of these, right? So because you change where you put the center atom, the, the neighborhood changes to, so, so, but, but the, the input is always a set, or actually technically it's a multi-set or an unordered tuple. Yeah? Uh, and so we have to deal with how to do this. And one of the simplest ways to, to, to write down functions of sets or functions of multi-sets is the many-body expansion or cluster expansion. And here's again my still in Javiba potential, just written in different notation now. So the site energy now becomes a, you know, a constant plus sum over pair interactions, plus sum over three-body interactions. And so it's two inputs means three-body because there's a center atom involved and two neighbors. And, and of course, that, that's not systematic, right? Why would it be? To make it systematic, you uh, add as many terms in this expansion as you want. Uh, and now you have something systematic because at least when you let n go to infinity, then you could converge this to anything, to, to, an, arbit to an arbitrarily complex site energy, okay? So that, there's, there's no, no new idea in this, of course, right? I mean, this, people have been writing down many body expansions for, for decades and they just stopped here because that's kind of the limit of computational, of what you can do computationally. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it just as a little common in practice, we never find we need to go to very high correlation order is what we call the N here is not the body order, it's the correlation order. Um, but, but that's a, a sort of a, just a side remark. It's really not, not, not essential. You, you could, that's the point. And uh, okay, so, so uh, okay, people stopped here for good reason. It's, it's hard to go beyond that. So, so here's now what, what we have to do with this. And so as you increase the complexity, as you increase, you go higher and higher in this expansion, in the order of this expansion, the, these, these potential terms look like they become more and more complex. So you have to figure something out what you do. And so I have to, yeah, first of all, we have to parameterize them. And what we will do is we will parameterize each of these Vn potentials by polynomials, uh, right? No, I said I wouldn't say the word, but okay. Yeah, uh, just polynomials, that, that is what we will use, yeah? Uh, but then you still have the problem that these sums here are, can become in, enormously long, right? So somehow you have to make this computationally tractable, right? You, you, you can't just, if, if I take n equals five, you can't just sum over all five clusters in your environment. That's actually you could, but you're not gonna run any large scale simulations with that, right? Um, and the last part uh, is that, of course, your model has to satisfy certain constraints, uh, not, not just roughly, not just as fitted to data, but exactly, and the ones we most care about are, are symmetries. Uh, so if, if you, if you permute atoms right, of the same species, then you have to get the, back, the same energy back out. If you rotate a cluster, then you have to get the same energy back out. And so that's, that's encoded here. So these are the two symmetries I most care about, um, permutation and, and, and uh, uh, isometry invariance of, of these potential terms. And all of, both of this, the computationally tractable, and the enforcement of physical symmetry will both come from that. Yeah. But in principle, you know, if all you care about is uh, 
to, to say, okay, I, I, what are these potentials about? What do you do? You could stop here. The, the rest is now technical details. This, this is sort of explains it, and this is why uh, I, I said at the start that there's absolutely no black magic in any of this. There's nothing, everything is clearly interpretable that we do. Okay, sorry, Lev, you had a question. We had also another symmetry associated with lattice invariant right. uh, shears. Yes. So if your cluster is big enough yes. and you kind of shear it, you can get exactly the yeah. same configuration. That's is built in. Reflected? Yeah, absolutely. That's built in. But it's invisible. Yes. It's 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 in the fact that it's in the fact that the that the input here is a set. So when you shear, so you, you look at this at this atom here, right? You shear the whole thing above. You see the same set. So the connectivity that you, you're asking about the connectivity really here, right? And, the, and, and I, there is no connectivity. I'm just taking, I, I sit on an atom, let me go back here. I sit on some atom in here, I draw a, I draw a ball, around, a sphere around it, and everything inside that sphere is my input. So now if I take a plane here and shear it, I got the same input, right? There is no reference involved. There is no reference, no, there's never a reference configuration involved in this, absolutely not. So it's present but implicit, while this rotational symmetry is explicitly invoked. Right. Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, you could say it this way. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think uh, so. Up to here, the, the important point is all we're doing is cluster expansion, right? And what's new is that we can take it to arbitrary order and make it efficient. Yeah. So I'm wondering how much does the, the last condition restrict the, the space? Right? So if I understood Paul right. correctly, he has just the symmetries as an additional input parameter for his uh, new network part. So just saying like well, what he said about the not invariant but equivariant mm. potentials. So they all in, they are still invariant. So so the, the 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 reason he says equivariant is because he has a. I didn't say, not, didn't say the word, right? He has layers, and in each layer, you can have equivariant features, which at the end, you contract into an invariant output. Okay. That, that's the key, and, and, the, and there's, a re, there's a really good reason why you want equivariant features in each layer, um, but I, maybe we can chat about that afterwards if you're interested. So at the end of the day, the output of the, of the site energy has to be invariant, because the energy must be invariant, and that's the only option, yeah? Okay, uh, but, but actually, so the, the, the network architectures that he uses are, are very similar in technology to what I'm about to show you. The, the underlying technology is always the same. Okay. Um, so I, 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 I don't know, how, how slowly am I going? Not, not too bad. So I thought, why, why don't I also just show how easy this is really to do, yeah? Um, so, so I'm just gonna run the whole thing quickly, and, and while it runs, uh, I'll, I'll Give your attention, put your attention to the most important line here, right? Okay, so you want to say at what order do you trunk, so what elements are, are, you, are you trying to simulate? At what order are you truncating the many-body expansion? How high do you go in the polynomial degree? Remember I said we parameterize these potentials by polynomials, and what's the cutoff radius? So this, this little circle that I draw. And that's basically it. Um, uh, for, ignore this. Um, Gawa can explain to you why you need this. Um, I, I just kind of trust him on this. Um, okay, so, so this here generates a model for you and it puts in about three years of experience in terms of how you make the rest around it work. And it, you know, it's not optimal, but it works well most of the time. Um, okay, so then uh, we have a little script that puts a, a few more uh, sort of heuristics into it. Um, right, so, so please fit the parameters in this model on that training data I just loaded and I used that solver. Okay, so it's in 30 seconds, it, it, it assembled the design matrix. It now estimated the parameters and the regularizer at the same time. And uh, by the time I'm done talking, it's already, oh, sorry about this. But at the time I'm talking, it, it, it spits out the, the, the test errors, okay? So, so this is a small training set, but not an unrealistically small training set. It's a small model, but, model, but not unrealistically small. It's actually the, the typical sort of system size, training set size that, 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 that Gabos people are using to model alloys. Yeah? Um, that was, you know, a, a few minutes in serial on that laptop. You know, for, for more complex problems, right? This is, this is not the most complex problem. Um, 
Of course, it can take hours, right? Uh, or but then you paralyze it and it's back to minutes. But anyhow, so so you, this thing you export it to a, to a file, you load it in in ASE, and then you run an MD simulation, and there you go. You now have a stable MD simulation of a perovskite. Okay, um, I just wanted to really point out this is easy and fast, and there's no hours and hours on a GPU to do this. Yes. Oh, right, accuracy. Gabo, do you want to take this? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole uncertainty quantification business, so what accuracy on energy and forces do you need for some macroscopic property that seems to be the whole super interesting thing that nobody knows and one yeah. can just get into it. But, uh, here you're seeing sort of milli e, two milli e's per atom um, for a material model, which where the crystal, not multiple crystal phases are present. You could get one milli e, some milli e. Uh, this will give you decent phonons uh, phase diagram. Uh, this perovskite phase diagram uh, is fine. Um, but the forces are quite high. Right? So the, the force errors are. This is a bit too high. We want to get that down a bit. Yeah. Milli e. Uh, so, but, but the, the, so the limit on that is actually probably uh, locality and k-point. Uh, so, so the k-point error uh, on that is on the order of the milli on the energies, and and could be on that order of the forces. Uh, but in my memory is that more than a factor two or so, we don't go beyond that. Am I misremembering this? Do we actually go beyond? So maybe you can get this down a bit, but. Yeah. Not no, no, significantly, no, no. right? And even mace, I'm not sure, would go... No, you, you run into k-point something else. Yeah. Okay. So let me... Okay, so you're, what you're saying is you have your ace, that's uh, atomic cluster expansion. Yeah. And that's... Is that like sort of a unique expansion satisfying your properties, or is it... Uh, unique? What do you mean by unique? If you specify all the symmetries you want, and et cetera, et cetera, is there some... Yeah, there's some uniqueness to that. Uh, then once you have that, then you do your training, and then mm -hmm. you have some way of... I'll, I'll show a little bit more on what, how, how, what this looks like. I haven't actually shown you yet. So I had a to-do list here, right? Yeah. Uh, where is my to-do list? <coughs> uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about this now. Yeah, yeah. You haven't, you, so I just saw in your code, you, somehow you were training. You didn't really say well, how you were really... So how I, saw, I, train? I saw the word Bayesian. It's linearly yeah. squares. What? It's literally linearly squares. Nope. But even in linearly squares, there are parameters that you don't always know. And so when you say Bayesian, that means there's a, uh, an empirical Bayes method somewhere in the background that estimates those parameters for you. Um, so if you would like, I'm happy to show you the details later. Very good. James is going to tell you how to do this. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I didn't want to get into this, but yes. So, so let, me, let, me, let me say it now. You know, this this many-body expansion, here I use it to directly predict the site energy, right? But you can predict whatever you want with it, right? And so, for example, you can, you can use that to predict the electron density, and then you stick it into a square root so that you have an EAM-like model. Like, like meme squared or whatever you want to call it, right? Meme plus plus. Um, why not? No, no, not really. So then it's not a linearly squares problem anymore. It becomes nonlinear, but you know, still, you still have hundreds of thousands of parameters instead of hundreds of thousands. You do BFGS and you're done. Yeah. So it won't be 30 seconds. It might be five minutes. Um, I'm not fussed about that. Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Um, okay. So um, the point of this slide is just to say, okay, there are many particle systems. Interatomic potentials is, is not, not the only applications of this, right? So, so you might want to train uh, a, a, a potential of mean force, right? Because you, you want to model some coarse grained uh, particles, you might. But if you do this right, then you also need the, 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 this friction operator here, right? Uh, or memory kernel if you want to do it really right. Um, so, so this is something interesting. Um, as I mentioned with James, we're thinking about oh, these, these uh, empirical, uh, semi-empirical electronic structure models. Here, what, what you want is you, you want to parameterize a Hamiltonian operator. But in, at the end of the day, the Hamiltonian is just a function of the particles in your system. Um, so it kind of falls into the same category of things, right? So, so the, 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 there are so many kind of um, objects that are just function of 
of particle configurations. And in all of these, you can, you can start asking how, how, how does, do these ideas apply? More recently, I started playing around with wave functions. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then at some point, I ran into a, a very, very strong undergraduate student who said, I want to do jet tagging with ACE. Um, so now we, we have a project in elementary particle physics as well. And I know nothing about this, but it's been fun nevertheless. So I'll, I'll try and talk about that briefly if I have the time. Um, OK, anyhow. Um, I, are you laughing at the reversal? Well, it, it goes this, this way, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, yeah, I'm not as good as draw, a drawing as Gawa, so I, I kind of just borrow other people's stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so, so, so now, uh, because of all these many different applications, just, just forget atoms, forget interatomic potentials, forget all of that, and, and just keep in mind there are many pot potential applications, so now we have to make it abstract to be able to do all of them. Uh, get one big hammer and then find many little nails, right? Okay. So the, 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 basically now, uh, the, I'm, the way I'm, I'm doing this is I, I, I say, okay, an, a, 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 a set or multi-set of xj, that, that's, th those are the, the, the particle configurations. You have, you have a configuration of particles, something abstract, right? Uh, let's not worry about what they are. Uh, all, all it means is it's a, it's a multi-set and these, these particles belong to some, some abstract space. That's the domain or the state space or whatever, whatever you would like to call it. Just think of it as a point cloud in, in some abstract space, okay? And what we're after is we're after predicting properties of these particle configurations. Yeah. And that's just a, fun a property, it's just a function, a mapping from these multi-sets to some, some target space. Uh, it, could be a, uh, it could be a scalar, it could be a tensor, it could be, could be a function, is for, for all I know. Yeah. Um, okay, and implicit in this, right, the fact that these are multisets is already uh, this permutation invariance that I talked about. And, uh, okay, so I have a few examples which you might not want to go through, but I, I mentioned atoms, uh, I mentioned electrons before, I mentioned elementary particles, right? Uh, but, but you could also take atoms and you could, you could give them additional features, right? Like a charge and so on. That all of that fits into this context. Um, and and so, so then the last part in, in this story, in this abstract setting, is that we also want the, these properties always, always, always come with symmetries. Not just the permutation symmetry, but, but some other group symmetries. Usually those are Lie groups. Um, and, and so I'm now asking that there's a... That this, so I'm going to focus purely on invariance. There are more general cases. That there are, um, you can have covariant properties and, and, and all sorts, uh, but I, I'll focus for simplicity only on invariant properties. I'm going to ask that this function f here, if you apply some, uh, a, a group action to all particles, then f remains invariant under that action. And uh, the, in, you know, for atoms, right, for, for, for interatomic potentials, that group will, of course, be O3. Um, but uh, when, you, when you have elementary particles, it will be the Lorentz group. Um, when you have, let's say, uh, magnetic atoms, then you have, uh, a, you have actually a, a product of O3 groups. So th there are all sorts of possibilities that come, come here. And then if you go into new domains, you'll find more groups. And it's a semi-simple Lie group, and that's all we need to know. And if you don't care about those minutia, there's a continuous group. OK? Um, all right. Uh, okay, so now, now back to the cluster expansion, right? So, so I, I ask, how do I parameterize a multiset function? And, uh, and okay, I already showed you, right? We already had that idea. We just do it with a cluster expansion. So write, write this as an expansion, and this is now the third time I'm writing it, uh, many, many, many more times. You truncate it, right? So this is your first approximation step already. Uh, the, you have potentially you, you have you have potentially many inputs in, in, from from this, these these sets here, but you truncate at an interaction order n, which means you have somehow a load of, if, if this n here is, is much smaller than the typical j, then you have a relatively low dimensional representation of, of, this, of this mapping, okay? And, and you can start asking questions under what conditions can you show this is, this actually converges this expansion and is accurate and so on, and I, I'm not gonna say more because I've already, yeah, I'm slow. Anyways, um, but, but the real challenge, I, I want to point that out again, I already said it, is how do you deal with this sum? Uh, and now 25 minutes in, I still haven't started talking about this one. Uh, so, so now, okay, here, here is the idea. Um, and, and this is not how, how Ralph originally wrote it, but then I think several of us in parallel realized that the way I'm showing you now is, is, is the most convenient way to think about this. So, so the, the trick is that you uh, okay, so, so the, the, 
what, what we're trying to do here by ordering the inputs, the input indices j1 less than dot 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 jn, is th that you have all these neighboring clusters, and then because this fn is permutation invariant, I don't need to visit every cluster many times, right? I, uh, so, um, and it turns out that I, that you try to optimize your computation that way, it turns out that was the problem. Yeah, um, you should, so if you, you, you first do something that seems like a ridiculous idea, why would you do this, right? So you replace the sum by a sum over all clusters many times, take many times, but in addition, so that there are, these j's do not need to be different, so I'm, I'm also in the sum, I'm taking uh, sort of clusters that are not really there, right? So I can take the same atom n times. That's, that's kind of a fake cluster as well, right? Uh, and that's also in this sum. And what happens here is that this sum here is over a much nicer domain, basically, right? So, so this sum here is, is over a domain that looks like this, and this sum is a domain that looks like that. And uh, this tensor product structure that you get here, this is what you can exploit, yeah? Uh, once you go to tensor products, life gets much better, yeah? Okay, so, so I, I'm calling this here the canonical formulation of the cluster expansion and that the uh, self-interaction formulation because by, ha by having these, uh, these sums over fake clusters in here, uh, you, you generate basically self-interaction between these particles which really comes from these terms here. And so you're kind of weirdly mixing everything up, mashing it together. And for now, let's just accept that and, and, and say, okay, this is an alternative way to write the cluster expansion, okay? Yeah. They don't have to be because the permutation variant is already here, right? Um, so, so this is a, this is a sum of all permutations as implicit, right? And, and so whether you and a permutation variant or not doesn't matter anymore. The f's have to be permutation variant. Okay. Um, okay. Good. Um, oh, maybe I should say this. In, in my group, we call this the clean and this the dirty cluster expansion. And we're trying to get rid of it, but that's another story. Um, okay. Um, okay, so, so how do we do it? You still have this big sum here, right? Um, so, so what happens with it? And uh, it's literally a, a one-line thing now, and, and we get rid of it, yeah? Um, so the first thing you do is you take, this, you take these, these potentials un, and you expand them into a tensor product basis. So this is what happens here, right? So I, I take, uh, here I'm defining a tensor product basis, I, I'm going to talk later about what these basis functions are, but basically you need a basis for one particle functions. Right? That's what these are. And then if you take tensor products of these, you end up with a basis for an n particle function. And then this here, if this is an orthogonal basis, then that it can be a convergent expansion for un. Okay, so that sum here carries over to here. So the next step you do is you take this sum here outside, and take this sum inside, but as you do that, you can interchange the product and the sum, and that is what, uh, what, 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 what Gabo uh, referred to as density trick, or I think Boris actually mentioned it, um, but we of course know this as Fubini's theorem. Um, sounds actually nicer, we should call it Fubini trick, it sounds like a bit of a, a magic trick, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so, so what happens is you, this n-dimensional sum becomes a one-dimensional sum, and all the complexity of the cluster expansion is gone with just this one quick argument. Yeah? Um, so so the, the, key, the key here was that you, you, you parameterize the n body potential by a tensor product basis, and then you can interchange summation and product, and this, 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 the curse of dimensionality that lives in this sum become, goes away completely. Yeah? Okay. So that is the first key idea. Okay, so, so let me try and, uh, and, and review this a little bit. What does this actually look like when you, when you implement this? Um, so, so, so again, this, this is the, the original, the, the way we wrote the cluster expansion, the, the, the dirty cluster expansion, right? And then um, we reformulate it in this way after expanding the UN in a tensor product basis. And so, so now how do you compute this? Well, the first step is to compute this inner sum here, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm calling a k to be just a sum over all j, phi k, x j. So what you see in here is, of course, that the number of inputs does not matter, right? Um, they just get lumped into that sum. Um, 
and you know if you're um, if you're familiar with 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 uh, machine learning literature, you probably know. But this this is essentially exact one of the ideas that also goes in, 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 into into those architectures. Okay, so then. You form the products, that's the second step. We call it pro product basis or, or end correlations. Um, uh, and again, it's a, it's a very simple operation here. Um, and then finally, oh, that comes next. Okay, so, so when you're here, you could in principle be done, right? You can, you can, you, because what these objects here are, you can, you can prove this very easily. It basically follows from the construction I've given you, is that if the, these, these functions here, the one particle basis function, if they are, a basis for one particle functions, then these products here become a basis for multiset functions. In the sense of any smooth multiset function, you can make precise what we mean by this, can be expanded in that basis, yeah? or uh, uh, represented to within arbitrary accuracy. Um, and you, you have a complete representation now of, of these potentials that you have right? um, with these extremely simple operations. Okay. Uh, what, what's missing now from my early requirements is the is the, the group invariance, right? So I, I want my this this target property that I'm after. I want to I want to make it invariant under some group action. We'll come to that in a second. Yeah. Okay. But, but this is the this this these two steps. That's th this part is, is is important. But but for, in terms of computational complexity, it's these two steps here that that make. That make the, the this this cluster expansion computationally efficient, and I can I can go into many details if, if people are interested, but maybe maybe after the talk. But I can exactly estimate how many terms you have and so on and so forth. Okay. So um, do I have time for this remark? Maybe I do. Um, so, so, so but okay, I won't go into details. I'll, I'll just quickly say it. So, so if you try and do the same with the canonical cluster expansion, you end up. At, at, a, at a dead end, but it turns out you can actually relate that, these two and you can come up with a linear transformation that makes the canonical cluster expansion also computable and um, I would say this is very much work in progress. I'm just mentioning it now that if you really don't like the self-interaction, um, tell me and I'll try and show you how you can do the other as well. Yeah? Can I this question with this? You have this stuff. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's part of this argument. Right? So basically, the n minus 1 part, you, put in, you, you can connect, relate to that. And that, that's, that's, what, that, that's part of that connection. But there are several caveats to get this. And it's not completely trivial. One has to go very carefully. Yeah. OK. OK, so now, now that's the. Uh, I think we're now uh, left with this last part, right? How do we actually make the make the, 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 this representation invariant? And and the idea is about as naive as it gets, I guess. Um, so you take the basis that we know is a complete basis for multiset functions, and you just average it over the group, and you're done, right? Okay, now you don't want to do this uh, because you don't want to compute this integral, right? And uh, say in a second how, how that works. But let's assume for a second you can compute this integral, right? Um, then it's actually really easy to show that this gives you a basis of G invariant, group invariant multiset function. So now you end up with something that where you have a, where you can write linear representations of any group invariant multiset function to within arbitrary accuracy, which is really quite nice. I like the linearity especially. Okay. Yeah. No, you have to need to a case. This is absolutely crucial um, because if you do it on the phi case, you're going to get rid of all the angular. So if you think of particles of, of atoms, then you would you would average out all the uh, the angular component. You're only left with with the radial, and uh, and all the information is gone. Yeah, that's absolutely crucial that you don't do it on the yeah. Uh, is that obvious? Okay, yes, I agree. That's a good point, yeah. I think it's, it's one perspective. I don't think it's the only one, but you're right. Absolutely right. I, and I probably that was the original motivation for E3 and N, right? Yes, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so, so now how do you do this in practice? Well, you can't. 
always. So now you need to be very careful how you choose the phi k, the, the, this embedding of the particles or the one particle basis, however you want to call it. Um, computer science, we call it embedding. I, we just call it a basis. Um, so basically, you need to choose a basis for which you have a representation of the group action. What that means is that if I apply the, the group, a group element to, to a particle, and then I evaluate the basis function on that, for example, a rotated particle, that's, that's what that could be, then, then I have to be able to write this uh, as, a, as a linear combination of the unrotated basis. Yeah? Um, and once you have that, then in this, in this integral here, you only integrate these representations or products of representations, and that you could, in principle, do as just a pre-computation on the group. In practice, you can actually do this analytically. You don't even do any numerical work here. Right? Uh, and and so, so what that then gives you is that this, this, this invariant basis B is just a linear operator applied to the non-invariant basis. That's it. And so now you have three operations. <laughs> a pooling takes some products, a tensor product, a symmetric tensor product really is what this is, and a linear operator applied to that, and you're done. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think it gets simpler than that, actually. OK, so, so maybe at this point, I, sh I should acknowledge a few people. Uh, so um, I, I think, I, I actually, I'll do this on the summary slide. Let, let, me, let me just move, move on quickly. So uh, let's skip this and skip that. Definitely skip that. OK, um, so if you, if, you, if you want to do this for, for, um, for, for potentials, machine learning potentials, now the group is O3. Right? The particles now are, are relative positions within an atomic environment, and chemical species comes into play. Uh, so, so, so now, what do you do? Well, the representation theory for three is, you know, you know that, right? So what, what that means is you, you need to use YLMs for, for your one particle basis. Uh, and and for, for the radial component, here you can do whatever you like. Um, there's an enormous amount of freedom in that, and uh, this is basically where some of some sort of modeling goes into, in, and, and, and a lot of people they, they just make this PN learnable, and and Lev, you'll be happy to know we do not. We actually write down exactly what it is, right? So I can tell you exactly what's in our basis. Right? Um, but uh, um, yeah, so for context, uh, we, we had an argument about all this being black box. So, so I, I I try to I try to defend us here a bit. Um, uh, but that's it, right? The, 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 from here on, the, the model is almost prescribed, right? You, st you still have to make a few choices, and if anybody wants to know the details, can, can talk to me. But uh, I, in, in a way, um, th th that's, that's the key step in the architecture. Yeah? And then once you have this, right, you, you now you, you go back to, okay, what was the model? Total energy is the sum of site energies. Site energies uh, are simply, a, give, give you a linear expansion in terms of this, this rotated basis. Uh, of this rotation invariant, rotation and, 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 and reflection invariant basis, and, and, that's, and that is our ACE model. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, so summary. Uh, uh, so, so, so I, I think I. Um, so, so I, first, first I, I would like to say ma many of these ideas I described, they've appeared prior to Ralph Trout's paper. Um, uh, you know, some, so, so, so for example, uh, Gabor's uh, gap potential already incorporates some of these ideas. Um, uh, Gabor, Genevieve, and I, we were working on a different way to make this cluster expansion computable. Um, that was, in many ways, very close to what Ralph was proposing, but there were, there were some key, there were really key, key ideas missing. And in a way, I think uh, Ralph was the first to just put all these ideas together and, and, and just made it crystal clear this is the only way to do it. Um, and I, I think that really, yeah, I think we dropped everything we were doing and continue, started to work on this then. And then the, the generalization to arbitrary Lie groups, this is something that uh, I've been working on with uh, another student of Gabor's, uh, Ilias Batatia, who's, uh, who, who's really uh, absolutely remarkable. <laughs> if, you've, if you can meet him, talk to him. Um, he, he can tell you lo loads more about what, what, I'm, what I'm telling you here. Okay, uh, so the summary is um, what you have now is a, is a systematic framework to parameterize not just invariant but general symmetric properties of particle systems. But uh, that, that's sort of the, I want to say, a narrow point of view. The broader point of view is the techniques I've shown you give you all the tools you need to put many body interactions in whatever model you want. 
Right? You have some model with pair interaction or three-body interaction. Actually, I'd like many body. These are the tools you need, more likely than not. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't yet run into, a, into an application where I couldn't find a way to use this somehow. Yeah. Okay. And, and just to make one point, um, right, so, so for example, when you, when you take the ideas I showed you and you put them into uh, this E3 and N network architecture, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it, and you remove some, some nonlinearities, you end up with uh, a model called MACE, which Gaba talked about on Monday. And with that model, you, you now absolutely get st absolutely state-of-the-art um, accuracy on, on pretty much any benchmark you try. So the point is, it's not just this particular model, but it's the idea behind it that can be applied in many different ways. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I now have only 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, okay, so here's what I'm going to... What I hadn't planned to talk about are coarse-grained mo uh, molecular models. Uh, I think this, we're really just ex starting to explore this, so it's not much to say. Uh, James will say a little bit about Hamiltonians, hopefully, so I might just skip that entirely. And so I, I'll talk a little bit about jet tagging and wave functions now. Okay. And, uh, but I, I, I just cannot help myself. I need to do this first. Because there were so many talks on non-local continuum models yesterday. I thought, okay, I... Um, how, how would I put many-body interaction into a non-local continuum model? Um, and, well, this is it, right? This is, uh, this is the many-body expansion in this case. And you have a multiple integral, just like we have a multiple sum. Well, you apply all these ace ideas, and there it is. Okay? So you, you, you do one-dimensional integrals, you form the products, right? There's the Fubini trick, and here you, can, you actually have integrals. You see that it's Fubini. You symmetrize them, and then your energy density you have here, uh, you, you, you write down a linear parameterization for that. And with something like this, you could actually have efficient many-bot interaction in, in non-local continuum models. I haven't tried this. Oh, I should maybe say this idea has appeared a few decades ago in a very, you know, in, in a classical DFT paper. Oh, you could do this, and then no, nobody ever used it. So it's, um, it's not like nobody knows about this, but, but nobody's using it for some reason. I just thought it was, it was a fun idea to, to mention. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. And uh, do I do chat tagging? I have eight minutes left now, right? Yeah. Oh, that's very kind. Okay, so I'll, I'll maybe do this quickly. I'll do this quick, quickly, right? So, so the, the, uh, the, the, this, this here is a super collider. And I, f I forget which one, but you smash particles together, right? And then and there's something completely outside of everything we've talked about, just to make the point how broad this idea is, right? Uh, you smash the particles together, they, 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 and then they, they, uh, they start decaying, right, into other particles. And then on the, on the, on the, on the walls of the collider, there you can take measurements. And you want to know whether there was, I don't know, uh, a Higgs boson in there or something like this, right? Uh, and, and so... You, make, you, have, you have hundreds of thousands of, of, of measurements every second, and you want to just throw out most of them because most of them, not, not, in most of them, nothing interesting happens. And, and that's called jet tagging. It's a, it's a, a simple classifier. So uh, you, you want a rough estimate. The particle I'm looking for, is it in that experiment or not? Okay. And uh, so now, what are the particles? Then they're, 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 they're now described in the simplest possible case by their form momentum and energy and momentum. And... Uh, and, and just from that, for, simply from that information, you want to you want to uh, you want to guess whether the particle you're looking for occurred in this in this sort of chain chain of events in, in that collider. And uh, okay, you, you, what what you want now is that this 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 classifier is invariant under rotations and boosts, so under Lorentz Lorentz group actions. And the reason for that is that if if you don't make that, that this is an, a, a fairly high dimensional group, you really want to. Uh, and and, it, and, and it, it also it transforms the, um, these, these jets into a frame where the classification becomes much, much easier. Uh, and, and when you do, and, and, and so, so what we did is, um, so, so this was, was this student I mentioned, Jose Munoz, who, who wanted to, to see, okay, can we, can we build a simple model with the ACE, with, with, with the ACE machinery? And uh, we, we didn't just sort of, uh, okay, implement the Lorentz group, put everything in, and, and press a button. But actually, we ended up uh, doing, doing quite a bit more. We said, OK, let's, let's think carefully about how to make this as simple as possible. 
so first we, we, we transform uh, momentum into cylindrical coordinates uh, along the, the jet axis, okay? Then we transform uh, the, the longitudinal component of, of the momentum into something called the rapidity. And the details, so the physicists would understand exactly why I'm doing this, um, or why he was doing this. Um, and, and because what happens then is that the boost just becomes a translation. And suddenly the, this, the really, really nasty Lorentz group becomes a translation group. And that's really fantastic, because when you do that, then you can take as the particle embedding here, you can just take exponentials, and that gives you a trivial representation of the, of the, of the group action. And for example, this averaging, you don't even need that anymore. And you simply say that, okay, I just have a subset of all my n correlations, and those will be the ones that are invariant. So there, there are some details you have to, uh, that I, I don't know, I'm skipping over, but the point is, with a little bit of, of fiddling and thinking and, and do this, you, you can actually make, ma make, this, make this extremely simple. And then, uh, now you, I have features, right? These, these product bases, these n correlations are many body features of the jet that I'm measuring. And that gives you a, a, quite a lot of, uh, a, a very rich description. Of, of, of these measurements. And now you, you, you just stick that, those features into a, a bunch of standard classifiers. You pick out the best one you like. And so in one way, say we were disappointed with what we got, that we only achieved 93% accuracy when sort of the, the state of the art was 94.5% at that point, right? But on the other hand, we managed to do this with a much, 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 much smaller um, uh, uh, classifier, far, far fewer parameters. So this here you cannot do actually uh, online during the experiment, right? Uh, this here you can easily do, make this part of the exper experimental apparatus, and th that, that was the goal, right? Um, and so you can go a little bit beyond, and uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to show this as a, a, something completely different you can do with this. Okay, and then maybe for the, for the five minutes, can I have five minutes? Okay, I, I want to show something else that's, again, quite different, um, which is a lot of fun, very, very early. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, we only literally just finished the first implementation of this. Um, so the examples I'm going to show you aren't that exciting, but uh, I, I really hope it's going to get more exciting in the next few months and years. So we want to solve the Schrödinger equation, right? Forget DFT, uh, the full Schrödinger equation, full electronic Schrödinger equation. And now, of course, uh, the particles are electrons, not, not, not atoms anymore. They get a position and a spin, fine, no problem. Uh, particle configuration has now a fixed length, that's fine. You, know, uh, you still have the permutation invariance, that's important. Uh, uh, actually, no, you don't have permutation invariance, right? Ah, with antisymmetry. Okay, so how do you deal with antisymmetry? Well, okay, people know how to deal with antisymmetry. You take antisymmetrized tensor products and you get Slater determinants, and you can, of course, solve that problem with Slater determinants, but nowadays people don't do that anymore, right? Uh, people use what is called the backflow transform. Um, and uh, what, 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 what that is, it's basically a Slater determinant, but the orbitals that are in here, right? So, so here are the standard uh, Slater orbitals. Now this, the, the orbitals in the backflow transform are much more general. You can they depend. They can depend on the entire electronic environment in a way, right? So, so uh, if if these orbitals depend on all the the particles, not just on xi, but they're symmetric with respect to exchange of the electrons other than xi, then the following happens: if you replace i and j, then it's exactly the same as swapping rows and columns in the matrix, and the determinant gives you antisymmetry. Okay, and so this is this is where the permutation invariance comes back in, and that's where we can use the ACE parameterization. Yeah. Um, and okay, here's now what this looks like. You, you start with a wave function parameterization with a backflow transform. You take, you say, what is the phi j? Okay, I first create an embedding as before, this, this pooling operation to create a symmetry, but I'm leaving out the i, right? Because I, I can only, I'm only allowed to permute these guys. Then I, then I form the, these n correlations or tensor products. But I also take care of, of parameterizing the first particle separately. Right? So then you have permutation invariance here of all the other particles, but the xi is, is still represented here. And that is a complete representation of these generalized orbitals. Okay. And you get all the performance that, that ACE gives you. Wonderful. Um, and now it's a really fun question that comes in here, at least I think it is. You can truncate this sum, of course, in such a way 
that you take only a lower correlation order, right? And if you take correlation order one here, then you have Hartree Fock. If you take correlation order two, then you suddenly have two correlations, three, four, five. You can, you can basically smoothly, um, well, discreetly smoothly, interpolate between Hartree Fock and a full wave function parameterization. And it's just an approximation parameter now. Um, this is something I really want to understand better, but I don't yet. I, all I know is you can do it. I, I, what, what the consequence of this is, I have no idea. Yeah. Okay, uh, so um, maybe I need to... Oh, yeah, if I have two minutes, I'll be okay. Uh, so th there's now one, one more part, right? Every time you, you come up with a, uh, with a parameterization for, for a wave function, you have to now somehow minimize that that high dimensional integral um, and, and the standard ways to do it with a version Monte Carlo, you replace the integral with a sample. And here, here's something that, another thing that the A spaces does, which is a, an advantage over the neural network parameterizations that people have used in recent years, is it's hierarchical. And so that means is you can do VMC hierarchically. You can, it's basically multi-level Monte Carlo for VMC. You, you can start with a coarse description, you converge your VMC, you refine it, you converge it, you refine it, and so basically a lot of the cost is up here, but the accuracy, you, the, the high accuracy uh, sampling happens very, at, only at very, very few steps. And, uh, and, and well, so, so these sort of simulations can, can run very efficiently because of that, because of this multi-level structure. Um, okay, uh, so this here, oh, it doesn't say here, I think this is oxygen. So eight electrons, not, not the hardest problem. As I said, these, these are all just sort of experiments, but one, once we have this, you can, can start running more and more experiments. And uh, so for example, here's a, here's a little, uh, little baby uh, molecule. Actually, I, I didn't say this before, uh, this is a molecule in, for, of one-dimensional particles, so it, we're really just, just starting out to do this, but, but the point is you can do the simulation, you can get very nice results. We, we, wherever we can find ways to test the convergence, you, you, we get very nice results. This is a, a dissociation curve for H8, and you can see uh, you know, exactly the correct asymptotic behavior um, that, that you expect. So, so the, the, the whole thing is very robust. Everything we try seems to look really, really good. And now back to the question about the correlation order, right? That's the one that really interests me. Um, it turns out we never have to go beyond correlation order two somehow. No experiment we ever did, here's, here's the same one from oxygen before, right? So this is correlation order one, two, three. Somehow we, we you, you never get any improvement as you go from two to three, and or it's marginal, it's within the statistical errors. and. I, I don't know why. Maybe the systems are too simple, um, but anyhow. So, so that's, yeah, number one. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you.